All right, guys, welcome back to the Make or Break show. We're hanging out with Keith Decent today. Uh, calling in from New York, hanging out with his cats uh, and doing who knows what today. But, man, thank you so much for jumping on and, uh, and chat with me. Looking forward to getting into your background, all the cool stuff you do on the audio as well as on the, uh, the making side. Cool. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, so excited to get into your story. Uh, I've definitely seen your stuff for a while now. And then uh, more, I guess, recently hearing your voice on an ongoing basis, uh, just with the, the podcast that you're doing uh, from the ground up, which has been which has been really cool to see uh, and kind of we'll probably start at the end a little bit. But uh, what was kind of your inspiration for that podcast and uh, wanting to put it out? Um, there were just there. I wanted to do a podcast for a long time, and every time I thought about maybe doing one like a panel show with somebody else, they were all everyone was all kind of busy and taken, or yeah. has no interest in doing one until somebody uh, with more YouTube followers asked them. Right. <laughs> and so I, and I was like, you know what, I could do one myself, but how exactly would I do a podcast by myself? And uh, I kind of just completely ripped off like. Uh, NPR style, like the Radiotopia, uh, Gimlet podcast, yeah. storytelling kind of investigative uh, type. And uh, I figured no one else is really doing that in the makerspace and in, in our kind of uh, community as far as podcast goes. So I just started writing scripts and figured I would get over the fact that I don't like my, my voice recorded, uh, at least within three episodes, I, I would at least get over that. So yeah yeah well you have a you have an awesome voice for for this though like it's a cool like gravelly but like it's a good like radio voice Thanks, yeah. i mean in the, in the best Ye way years so. of years of abuse yeah. <laughs> it's like the tom waits uh i'm on my path down to tom waitsville it's that's a that's a good one to go after uh yeah when i was starting just the interview when i was like i know it'll be a little bit more work just because of the scheduling side and all that kind of stuff but I mean, what you're doing is for people that don't know i mean that's good deal of work i mean you're writing full scripts for for everything you're doing is that right yeah it's between a five and eight page script uh every episode which is about um 10 to 15 minutes read and then once i put in everything in the audio uh in the edit i mean after i put everything together and put in all the breaks because i talk too fast and put in some music it becomes about between a 10 and 20 minute podcast depending on the story i'm telling but that's also about it's hard to it's hard to gauge how many hours of research there are okay. but i think the most i've done so far was the one I'm, the one i'm putting out hopefully tonight which is uh probably about 30 hours of research good just night. just yeah it's crazy yeah where uh where do you get like your ideas or your like your topic ideas uh luckily when you make a podcast about like stuff <laughs> you realize that there's lots of stuff around. I guess I just right. kind of look around the workshop and I'm like, I wonder where that came from or who thought of that first or like, yeah, I like to think of simple things that we all have lying around that no one really knows the history of. Yeah. Um, or I just, if I hear about something cool, like I did an episode on Brian May's guitar, the, yeah. the guitars from queen and how he built it with his dad. And that was like one of those serendipitous things where it just happened around father's day. So it was just the right timing. And he made his guitar out of reclaim materials and they worked together on it. And it was the, the story just, it sounded great. And I saw an article on it because he just wrote a book about it. Oh, cool. And uh, I was like, sure, I'm going to do that. Let's, let's dig into that story. Yeah. 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 So it's, it's a, it's a lot of work what you're doing and I get, yeah. definitely encourage people to, to check it out uh, from the ground up. Is it just from the, or FTGU? Uh, FTGUpodcast.com. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, Sorry, no, <laughs> cat, no, yeah, yeah, cat, go, the go cat ahead, bit go. me. I'm, try, I'm trying to get her to not be meowing. <laughs> Do you say she bit you or she? Well, like, she's, she's being playful, but yeah. She's oh, okay, me. gotcha, gotcha. Uh, yeah, the yeah the amount of work that uh, that you're putting into it, I can't I can't imagine compared to like the I guess the three person panel show. It's a uh, you're not just just yeah. record for an hour. So. Exactly, it's not just hit record and then uh, bleep out the curses and hit upload. It's uh, <laughs> it's why it's why I'm only doing one a month for now. I'm, yeah. I'm kind of dipping my toe into it and hopefully you know hopefully the patreon funds or some advertising comes through and i can do a little more because i'm really enjoying it so far it was it was just a weird weird idea that i had and yeah, I, jumped, yeah, yeah. I jumped i jumped wholly into it now it's just it's taken off a bit people really seem to enjoy it yeah it's a it's a it's a great one uh because initially i was like I would, i'd love to do some more of those like npr style shows and i was like no way <laughs> the amount of work is going to take forever so uh, yeah it's well, luckily i've been i'm good at research i just have a knack for it so it, it works out that way yeah how what's that what's like the research process 
mostly like? mostly it's just googling and then digging okay, deeper yeah. Uh, the easiest step one is go to the Wikipedia article and then scroll all the way to the bottom to the sources. Yeah. And then just start from there. And then. So are you. Go oh, ahead. yeah. That was. Well, I try to find like um, an interesting hinge for the story, like something like a crux to it, something something I can delve into and tell the human side or at least the history right. side of, of what's going on. And then I build out from there. Um, so it, it doesn't always run linearly. It's not like uh, I just say, OK, the first thing that happened in the story is this. The next thing is that. Yeah. I like to focus on a very interesting part and build more of a cinematic kind of story out of it and then narrate the whole thing through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like you almost have to have that like character or something like you can relate to on like a human level for people to get pulled into it. Yeah, the one I'm working on now, I just finished recording <clears throat> last night was uh it's the history of the screw. And I start off with I start off with a shipwreck being discovered off the coast of uh the port of Rotterdam in in the Netherlands. So yeah, you know, that's like a sample of how like I would you know, go from one thing to the other. It doesn't seem like it would make any sense, but it actually kind of works with the whole thing. No, that's, that's good. So what, uh, what podcast do you listen to then? Um, I listen to a buttload of podcasts. Okay. Okay. Um, I mean, yeah, I like, I like like radio lab, um, NPR, uh, 99% invisible is huge. Um, the one I probably steal the most from is called memory palace with Nate DeMeo, which is literally, him just telling a story it's like between eight and ten minutes and it's like once a yeah. month it's a fantastic podcast and he does a great job um anything that's good storytelling I, I i'm burnt out on true crime podcasts like everybody else seems to be getting um yeah and all the maker ones i listen to as many of the maker podcasts as i can even though there's five billion of them now <laughs> yeah yeah what uh what podcast when they have an episode come out like goes to the top of your list of stuff to listen to um you know, it really depends on on I'm one of those people. It depends on the title and the topic. Is okay. uh, I listen to Reclaimed Audio every time. Um, those guys have great chemistry. Honestly, yeah. just when they're when they're talking to each other, it's it, a pleasure to listen to them. Uh, Making it Wood Talk, Modern Wood, uh, the Modern Woodworkers Association, uh, Modern Maker Podcast. Those I listen to tend to listen to right away. Okay. Yeah. Um, mostly because they're my friends. <laughs> it's right, kind right. of yeah, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And then, and and no offense, it depends on who's being interviewed on an interview podcast. If I've never heard of them, I'll take a time when totally. I can when I can soak it in a little more. You know, I like to yeah, if I'm down yeah, a yeah. workshop, then I like to listen to more of an interview style podcast or something with a deeper story that I can yeah. you know kind of tune in for. Yeah, the uh, yeah the the three people talking. It's like once you once you get to know them all, like they're hard to not listen to because like you said, it's just like catching up with with friends. So. Exactly, like you're on a car ride. It's like having three extra people in the car with you. You know. Yeah, 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 that's cool. Uh, well, uh, I don't want to talk to you about podcasts all the time because I definitely could. But um, <laughs> so you mentioned storytelling a few times. Do you have like a background in that at all, or is that just something you've always naturally been interested in, or what does that? No, I. Um, in the few instances that I've had to write stuff in my life, uh, being an artist, pretty much since my youth, uh, I've just been told that I'm a good writer, and it eventually you get told something enough, and you have to assume that there's some pebble of truth to it. Yeah. And uh, so I've just been working on those skills, uh, you know, every time I have an opportunity to like if I'm right, if I'm writing copy for a website or if I'm writing my bio or whatever it is, I, I will try to uh, sharpen that as much as I can. What uh, so what type of art were you into then as a kid? Comic books, comic almost books. entirely comic books. Yeah, that was uh, um, that's how I got started doing just about everything was was drawing the characters, drawing the covers over and over again, then drawing my own really ridiculously terrible comic books and stapling them yeah. together, you know, on the computer paper. What, um, were, uh, what were the ones you rented? Oh, Spider Man's the biggest one for me. Okay. Um, hands down, Spider Man, X Men. Um, I, I like them all, honestly. Like, and then, like, as I got older, I got into more kind of independent comics and stuff, but. Um, there's an independent comic called Scud, the Disposable Assassin, which has had like a lasting impact on me. It's done by this guy named Rob Schraub, and it was in the '90s, and it's just it's it, it's insane. <laughs> it's just a crazy comic. It's about an assassin robot that was taken out of a vending machine to stop the end of the world by killing one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And it's it's, it's something I'd recommend if somebody loves comic books. Check out Scud, the Disposable Assassin. You can get anthologies of it now. That's crazy. Uh, so are you going to have some type of making slant of, uh, of Marvel, like Stanley, any of that kind of stuff here recently? Like, is there going to be like an episode around that? Uh, I've been trying to figure out an entry point into that because okay. you don't yeah. want to do it. Like 
Well, especially, I mean, Stanley's passing had a huge impact on me because his work right. had a huge impact on me. But when someone dies, it's tough to have something prepared, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, so you want to get it. I want to get something out, but I don't want to rush it, you know? Yeah. So it would probably be, I mean, my turnaround on an episode is usually a couple of months worth. Of, I get the idea, then I've got it writing in the background of when I'm doing something else and researching. And then, you know, a couple months later, the idea comes out. It doesn't usually yeah. happen very quickly. Yeah. So, so were you were you like the art kid then in high yeah. school? Oh that? yeah. Okay. That was me. <laughs> I was the president of the art club two years in a row. It was yeah, it was uh that that was my my uh my background and all I wanted to do all the time. Were you painting, drawing, like just everything? Like what were what were the um, you were working in? It was all it was almost entirely two D art. So I started out with illustrating because the comic books got me there. So I was really good with a micron pen and a few sheets of paper. Uh, I got into painting uh, and then I went to art school and college briefly. I didn't finish college because <clears throat> I had some fundamental disagreements with what they were teaching. Um, basically, I wanted to be an artist and they wanted to turn me into a businessman. And I wasn't really, yeah. really having that. Uh, and I got into painting after college and I've been painting ever since. So what um, so what about the business piece in college did you not like? Uh, well, what, what it was, was um, I was already running kind of a successful graphic design firm when I went into college because uh, okay. it was that dot-com bubble at that time. And, yeah. and, you know, people were just throwing money at you if you had any idea what you were doing on the Internet. And so I was doing that and I wanted to go for painting, sculpting, drawing, you know, the hard arts and stuff. I really felt like I had a gap and needed to fill like because I was already better at pro programming and graphic design. And they said, yeah, sure, come on, we got that. We're going to be teaching all that that great stuff. It's in the curriculum. So I, I applied and got in and went there. And as I got there, they were like, oh, uh, we're changing the whole curriculum. We're focusing on illustration and graphic design mm -hmm. and how to be a business, like the business of yeah. you know, digital art and stuff. And I just was not having it for a couple of years. Yeah. Was that, where was that at? Uh, University of Michigan, School of Art and Design. Oh, Michigan. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Um, so when you uh, left, uh, were you still just freelancing? Was that kind of your yeah? I was, I was I was freelancing, and right when I got back, I decided I was like, I'll just go back and reopen my business and get some of my old clients back and start again. And uh, the bubble burst and the economy tanked, yeah. and uh, that was my introduction to digging holes for a living, for for money, yeah. just whatever I could do at that point was what I was doing. Uh, Wait, so when. So, so you said you, so you started the business sounds like in high school then? If yeah. You into college? Yeah. I was What's building that? websites since seventh grade uh, prof okay. professionally. Yeah. On the business side of things, like I know most seventh graders, I, I wasn't thinking of like running my own business and like charging people for stuff. Like, was that weird? Like, were your parents entrepreneurs? Like, where does that come from? Um, no, my parents weren't entrepreneurs. That was just the right place at the right time. I was okay. good at it. And I had a couple of people who were family friends and, um, one of them was my sister's boss at this uh, store out in uh, this summer town where we used to work in the summers and go into summers. Um, and they knew that I could do it and they knew that I was a kid so they could undercharge me. They could, you know, <laughs> they could, they yeah. could, they could lowball me and I'd be super happy about it. Right. And that's kind of how it worked out. So I was, I, I only did, when I say seventh grade professionally, maybe I did two websites in seventh grade and help with some coding. And then by about when I was 14, 15 years old is when I was actually, doing the work sitting in front of the computer in the guy's office um being hired freelance for that sort of thing gotcha so um when you went to it sounds like construction were you also still trying to keep the art side of stuff alive on the side in your free time or was it you're just pretty much just making a living i was just making a living um it wasn't just construction it's kind of whatever would come my way i okay. did some uh, pa work for photo shoots for a while um you know stand here hold that move this just the grunt work is basically what I was doing with everything. Yeah. Um, and then I saved up enough money and moved back to the city and started DJing karaoke for a while. That was a lot of fun. Really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I've been all over the place. Um, I was a Zamboni driver for a little while after college. Just <laughs> whatever. If you, if you would pay me for a thing and I thought I could logically do it, I would do it. That was basically it. Yeah. Um, Wait, so what, what do you, how do you DJ karaoke? Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a whole thing. Uh, there's a program and it kind of has all the songs and stuff like that. And basically right. you're, you're running the party and someone comes up and requests whatever they want to do. And you got to punch the code in and put it up and make sure that they don't break anything. And it's just, it's, it's like being a bartender without the the fun parts. Yeah. No, there's like no alcohol. That there's, I mean, I had, I got to drink for free, which is good. 
uh, I think they realized the mental health tax that came with being the, the karaoke DJ in the back room yeah. was just to get me free bottom shelf liquor. Yeah. <laughs> for, yeah I mean, you're just listening to people just horribly sing all day. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, some people were really good, but some people were really bad. As long as I had fun, excuse me, that was the, the most, uh, the most fun part. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what was kind of the craziest job you had? Was that it during that kind of period? Um, probably. Yeah. The, the, I'd say the job itself wasn't too crazy after a while. It was literally just running a program on a computer and, and maintaining a list. But everything else that happened around the job was the crazy stuff. I mean, if you've ever worked or anybody's ever worked nightlife at a bar uh, in a place like Brooklyn, New York in the in the mid 2000s, it's kind of, you know, it gets pretty zany. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing. Uh, stories I can't really tell on a podcast for the most part. <laughs> that's that's totally fine. So were you doing art then throughout this period or was it? Yeah, kind sometimes. Of on the I lived in a loft with uh with three roommates and I built some stuff for the loft uh furniture wise like simple you know like a beer bong table or whatever we needed and it turned I really wanted to do more of that and it turns out that there was just no good dust collection for any of my tools mm -hmm. so I had like a circular saw and my we built lofts and we built the bedrooms up uh in the loft and uh my roommates realized that just a cloud of sawdust is always going to float right into their bedrooms every time I do anything yeah so that kind of could put the uh yeah, kind of cut that off pretty quick for me. But I did uh, com. I made comics here and there. Um, I used to make like a da uh, not a daily, but like I guess a, whenever I got to it, daily esque uh, little slice of life comic for a while. Um, and yeah, that's most of what I was. Doing. I'm trying. I'm really like straining my brain because I think most of the time it was just being hung over and trying to make it back to work on time for a couple yeah. of years. Yeah. So was that uh, like? on the making side of things, uh, more, I guess more traditional people think making, um, the building like furniture and stuff, was that kind of your first entry into that? Or had you always kind of been working with tools in addition to kind of the fine art stuff? Yeah, no, I was, I didn't work with tools very much. Um, I got a taste of it here and there doing the grunt work for these other jobs. But, uh, my uncle who was a contractor and a very, very good contractor and a good guy, uh, said that he would help build the lofts into this big empty, um loft apartment that we were moving into my my friends and i so one of them was an architect so he designed the space using like as little osb and plywood as we could like he like he optimized the whole design and everything and then my uncle and i went in there and built it in three days and that was kind of my 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 kick in the butt getting back towards making stuff uh at that point which is it was a lot of fun yeah yeah so as you're working the odd jobs um was there a point where you wanted to move towards maybe something you had a little more ownership of or like running your own thing? Or was it kind of like a natural evolution to where you're at now? Yeah, it just kind of happened that way. I've always been able to work for myself better than I've been able to work for somebody else. Um, just, just the way my brain works. Yeah. And uh, so in my experience from when I was younger, having my own business, I knew I could do it. I didn't, I don't necessarily love running my own business. It'd be great if I had, enough, I made enough money to have like an accountant or something, but uh, yeah. Now, for the most part, it's just uh, it's I'm more comfortable with it. When I have ownership over a thing, I know that that thing can be as good as I can make it. And then that way I can it, it all falls on me, which is a lot, a lot easier for me to deal with. I'm sure people can relate when you start when you start handing off parts of your business to other people to uh, to try to handle some of the responsibilities. It's like I just become intolerable. I'm like the guy over the shoulder all the time. Right, right. Like, you know, why don't you do it like this? And they're a professional and I've been doing it in spare time for like three weeks and I think I know better. Yeah. So were you um were you building small projects? Were you selling art? Um like how were you actually making money from your own from your own Yeah. Uh what I ended up doing after um after uh I just had enough of <laughs> the nightlife stuff uh down in the city i ended up moving back up to yonkers uh where i grew up which is just outside of new york city and uh my cousin was doing estate sale cleanouts and um i knew enough about old tools and i was good at research and so i could i was the guy in the basement of the estate sale where the guy who you know, like was the master carpenter in the 1950s he passed away and left all his tools to nobody and so we had to sell them so i was down in the basement i was the guy who was basically pricing everything selling it oh. negotiating the deals and yeah I started kind of building a collection of cool stuff up from there because I've always liked antiques and old stuff and weird things. Uh, and then we were, we started getting tables at local flea markets to help with the, um, 
with the extra stuff that we had uh, at the end of a sale. You don't know what to do with everything. And uh, the ho- the homeowners usually like just throw it out, just get rid of it because it's either not theirs or they don't want it or whatever. And so we would keep the really cool stuff that we thought was worth something because we're pack rats. And uh, then we'd sell it at flea markets. And I started seeing people who were making their own stuff at the flea markets. And I was pretty well convinced that I could do a better job than they were. Uh, and a few YouTube videos later, and I was uh, putting together skis as a like old wooden skis as an end table or making a bench out of an old theater chair, or, you know, stuff that was already pretty much mostly manufactured. I was just screwing yeah. it together in, in interesting ways and it, it caught on from there. And uh, I just, I fell in love with it and I just started doing more actual woodworking and metalworking later on. So at that point, were you mostly selling like at flea markets? Oh like yeah. Entirely. Anything online? Okay. Entirely. Uh, I had an Etsy store, but it was, you know, Etsy can be, Etsy's a fickle mistress, you know, it's like yeah. uh, if you're selling something truly unique on Etsy, you're going to have a really hard time getting people to go to your, your, uh, your site, your, your yeah. page. And if you're selling the same thing as everyone else, you're going to have a really hard time standing out because it's a lot of hobbyists selling stuff at a, almost a loss because they don't, you know, if the only person you have to answer to is maybe your spouse to break even for your hobby, then you're going to be undercutting pretty much every professional out there trying their best to, yeah to get things done. Yeah. Uh, so on the unique materials, that's, that's definitely something when I look like through, whether it's your YouTube, your Instagram or your old work, like it's always these like just crazy materials, not crazy materials, but like crazy things you're building out of materials. Has mm-hmm. that like reclaimed piece, was that out of necessity to start out? Or is that always kind of like, I really want to like use stuff that was meant for something else, but kind of bring it back to life. It was kind of both. Uh, it's really easy to make something if half of the manufacturing has already been done for you. Yeah. Uh, which is nice because if you're selling at flea markets, you want you got turnover and you got to have new stuff and it's like a weekly thing, you know? So if I can build something in three days because it's already a box, like a cabinet or a, an old suitcase or something like that and put legs on it, then hell, I'm going to do that, you know? Plus, I also really like the, the artistic uh, challenge of seeing of looking at something and seeing what I can do with it. Mm-hmm. And I do a lot of, I would look on Pinterest or something and see what everyone else had done with that object and then try really hard to do something different, just slightly different even, but do it just not exactly the same way. What is the craziest thing you've like transformed? Uh, probably the 1940s refrigerator into a um, rolling dry bar. That was, <laughs> uh, that was one of them that, that just was, I mean, it was heavy. I had that yeah, thing sitting yeah. Sitting in storage for a long time. Um, that's a, that's one thing that always pops to mind first is the fridge because I would make a joke. I'd have people ask me why I don't sell plans for my for my projects, and I'm like, well, when the plan starts with go find a, an abandoned refrigerator from the 1950s, I don't think step two <laughs> is going to happen very often. Yeah, yeah, um, but yeah, probably the fridge. And there's a there's a really terrible video of that on my YouTube channel. Um, I lost so much footage, and I just stitched it together, and I was like, yeah, that's the best I could do. Yeah, yeah. So you, because uh, you've been on YouTube what, about three years, is that right? I think, yeah, it's it's four, I think, now. I don't know. Oh, okay. it, it's. I mean, how long have I been taking it seriously? That's a different <laughs> story. It's um, been bef- before a while. So were you, um, I mean, were you just watching other people post? And so you're like, I should like throw some of my stuff, own stuff out there as well? Yeah, just like everybody else, I saw Jimmy. I saw Jimmy DeResta, and I was like, oh, I could do that. And then I realized how much talented he is. Yeah. Uh, not just to be making this stuff, but to be balancing even his simple style of video. There's a there's a um, a genius to it. How how um, elegant it is, because he always gets the right shot. He always makes it work, and it's worth watching, even though there's not much going on in terms of uh, behind the scenes editing. You know, it yeah. seems it seems like he's just pointing the camera at the thing and going. But if you just point the camera at the thing and go, it's going to be terrible. Right. You know. Right. So. Uh, yeah, so I saw him making stuff, and then I did my first video, which is I think I bent a um, an old aluminum ruler into a um, money clip. I think that was the first one I put out. And I was like, yeah, that was easy, not realizing how just awful that video was. <laughs> and uh, I loved it from there. I just kept going. Did uh, so Did you know Jimmy at that point? And for people that, that don't know who we're talking about, Jimmy Duresta. So since you were both in like, I guess, kind of the same area. Yeah, we're, we're really close to get, uh, I did not know him. Um, okay. It turns out that he was on Twitter one day when I, this is a story of how I first met him, I guess. He was on Twitter one day talking about, or as a podcast, he was on his podcast and he was saying something along the lines of, 
Um, he had all these tools that he had to get rid of and make space for. And he guess he's just going to rattle them off to, to listeners maybe. And I sent him a message on Twitter and I was like, Hey, if you know, I, j- I just started a maker cooperative with a couple other people and I was like, we could use some tools. Uh, if you don't mind, if I come up and like, maybe get one or two of those, he's like, come take them all. <laughs> so huh. I was like, all right. So he borrowed my friend's truck and drove up and met Jimmy on his farm. And he gave me a whole bunch of tools. That's crazy. That's yeah, really cool. He, he's that's just, that's just him. He's like the nicest guy. It's, it's yeah. insane. Yeah. All right. So, uh, maker co-op, um, is that like you guys are sharing like, yeah, it, it, tools? Was, is that the idea? it was a, uh, so when I was selling at the local flea market here in beacon where I live now, uh, we had, there's a few people around and one of the other guys at the booth next to me, we just started commiserating over having to stand in a hot parking lot from 6 AM until 6 PM. And, uh, we got to talking and realized that maybe we do better if we pooled our resources and sold out of one tent instead of two, cause we were doing similar things. And, um, that was my friend Rob and we became kind of creative partners and started pushing each other a little more. And we brought in another guy who was a, an interior designer who was also uh, doing repurposing and reclaiming. And then another guy who we taught, who wanted to learn woodworking. So we had an interior designer, uh, an engineer, basically me, the artist, we had a guy who wanted to learn and we had a couple more people after that, that got added. We ended up with a store space through just happenstance here on main street, which is not easy to get. Uh, we had a really good time for a couple of years. And then we realized that owning a store kind of sucks because you have to be there all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And everyone just kind of ended up going their separate ways after a couple of years, but it was fun. We, we shared ownership of the direction that we went in, but we all sold stuff on under our own kind of business through it. So it was a cooperative effort, but we each reaped our own reward for how much work we put in. Yeah, that's cool. How would you, go about like setting up a shop like a a collaborative shop versus just having something one off that was that was like what we were tackling right as it tapered off um we were looking for a collaborative space and so i don't really know (laughs) it was just uh that was that was the problem we were trying to solve which is how we get a space together how we make sure membership can support the space and how you know what tools go in and all that kind of stuff. Oh, so, so you guys were thinking full like makerspace. Yeah. Kind of, but like kind of private makerspace to begin with, Got it. um, okay. just for like five of us. And then maybe uh, I, I wanted to expand. I kind of had, uh, a bit of a little mini, mini dream at that point to open a makerspace and, and have it be that way. But I realized that I'm just not one for management. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I can imagine that it's, that can get just turned into a mess with everybody coming in and out. And all yeah, that. I'd rather go into the shop and make something than sit there right. and do timetables for everybody else to make something. Yes, I, I totally get that. So uh, fast forward to the, to today, um, is it mostly still selling like custom pieces? Is that where like a lot of your work goes towards? Yeah, most of it. Uh, when it slows down, I take up odd jobs here and there doing like finished carpentry or, you know, if someone needs like, yeah, hell, someone needs their lawn break. I'll do that if I'm if I'm short on cash. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it's mostly selling custom stuff uh, directly to customers. I have a lot of great local customers here. It ends up being a lot of floating shelves and rustic barn doors in between what I actually like doing. Yeah, and I'm trying to make that transition more towards kind of content creation. But yeah, it's a slow. It's a slow uh, drive that way. Yeah, yeah. How do you uh, how, how do you get customers? Is it just just over the years you've built up kind of a client base. Yeah, uh, for the most part, my Instagram following is is uh, s- kind of substantial, and it's been a lot of local followers. I did a, a, a really good job early on making sure that just about everyone in my city knew who I was. Oh, cool. You know, using local hashtags and kind of like you know, tagging the right locations for everything, and handing out business cards at the flea market and, and all that. So that way, when people, I'm the first, per- I'm the first person a lot of people think of when it comes to custom work. And also when it comes to, I've got this thing that I want to get rid of, but I don't want to haul it all the way to the dump. Yeah, <laughs> they'll, yeah. they'll drive by my house first and ask me if I want it, you know? Yeah. yeah that's what I was going to ask kind of what the, that, the creative process looks like for you. Does it start with kind of the material or how, what, or is it kind of a, a bunch of different things? Uh, it really depends. I think more these days I've been, um, because I've gotten to the point where I can fabricate a lot better than I used to be able to from um, raw material or raw-ish material. Yeah. Uh, it becomes a lot more idea first these days, but uh, you know, still, still like it used to be for me, still a lot of the time I can look at an object and say, I know exactly what I want to do with that, or I have a good idea of what I want to do with that and then work at it from there. So it's 60, 40, 
idea first or or uh, material first for me. So do clients come to you with ideas or are you saying, hey, this is a cool idea. Who who wants to get this? I, it's funny because as I talk about getting away from custom work, I realize that I'm actually really, excuse me, sorry. I'm really fortunate. No, um, I'm actually really fortunate in the way that I operate because uh, a lot of people who do who do custom work will tell you they're tired of getting approached with someone with an open restoration hardware catalog that says, hey, can you make this table but cheaper or bigger or smaller or whatever? Because yeah. that gets really tiresome because, no, I can't. I can't make that cheaper for you. This is not yeah. how it works. Uh, nowadays, what I get most of is someone just tells me, hey, I've got this open spot. I like this kind of style that you do. Um, here's the kind of piece of furniture I want. What w I want your piece. So it's more of like uh, an, uh, an art commission a lot of the time yeah, yeah. for me now, which is good. Um, it's like a design brief sounds like. Exactly. Yeah. They'll just t say, Hey, I want a record console, like m kind of mid century ish, but also rustic, which is something I do. And, uh, you know, it's gotta be this big. And so I'm like, okay. And I just draw up some designs and see what they like and then go from there. So you've got the brief. How do you work through designs? Like you're iterating on a bunch of different things. Like how does, well, I learned, like? I learned in the days of doing graphic design for people not to give too much uh, okay. to the client because you end up, you know, with like, oh, I want a piece of this and I want that and I want this and I want that. It's it's easier for me to approach them with the finished one that I like the most okay. and then maybe a couple of uh, little vignettes of I, I hand draw my plans too. If I, okay. if I need to draw plans at all, I hand draw them. It's just quicker for me. Um, with a couple of vignettes of like, here's how I can do the corner a little different, or maybe this angle could splay out this way instead of going straight. And that usually works really well. So that's cool. So is your shop, uh, then at your house or is it separate? Yeah, it's in my basement. Uh, this, the room I'm in now is actually my studio. It's, um, I had, it's a, it's a dining room, living room kind of combination. Cool. And I don't need a dining room because yeah. it's just me. So I have a workbench over there and this is kind of where I do the, the soft art for the most part, or if I'm like putting hinges on something, I'll do it up here. And then yeah. the dirt, the dirty work happens down in the basement, which is an inch shorter than I am. So oh, no. Oh yeah. yeah. It's one of those things. Yeah, it's like a cave. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I guess I, I didn't realize watching your videos, how, how short those, uh, the ceilings were. That's, that's nuts. Yeah. That's why you don't realize it. Cause I, I literally can't do like, a full body shot because yeah. I just be like, I just have my neck right to the side. <laughs> it's all like real, real tight. <laughs> it's all real tight. Crap. Yeah, exactly. So are you also then doing just pieces just for you? Like just, just for fun or is it mostly commission? Stuff? I try to do pieces just for me. Um, it's time considerations for the most part. I did one um, that I know I'm not going to sell, which was the, the hand tools thing, which was basically I carved my hand. And then I took the handles of a bunch of different tools like uh, ice pick, uh, Zacto knife, um, and some carving tools. And I carved them to look like my fingers. And so they go into the main part of the hand. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and so it's like a stand for tools, but it's hand tools and it is a hand and the tools are fingers. It's one of the weird things I had an idea for. And I was like, well, that's mine. <laughs> so I kept that one. That's cool. But, yeah. That, because you did a video on that uh, like several months ago, right? Yeah. That was, that was, yeah, at least six months ago, I think. Okay. Uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. And I'm doing a foot plane pretty soon too, which is going to be a hand plane that looks like a foot. It looks that's, like my foot. That's yeah. that, like, is usable? Yeah, it's going to be completely usable. And I don't know why I'm doing these things, but it's just the idea I had. And I'm like, I think people will watch this. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's cool. So you mentioned that, uh, that content was a piece you wanted to build up, especially on the, on the business side. Mm -hmm. Um, so what is that? look like when you're thinking through especially like looking into 2019 is it's producing more interesting pieces and video and um kind of how are you thinking through that yeah it's it's mostly um trying to produce better work and more interesting work and that way get the attention for what i want as opposed to being a guy who can make a table out of a suitcase which there's a trillion of online i'd rather be the guy who can turn a hand plane into a foot and then yeah you know, yeah, yeah and that way i can i can bring people along with my journey as opposed to just kind of trying to trying to serve what I think they want to see. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, so from the ground up, you mentioned uh, once a month right now. Mm -hmm. um, if I can, I mean, it's sometimes <laughs> this, this month's going to be two because last month I did zero because that's just what happens sometimes. So uh, do you want to build that up uh, on release side of things? If like financially you can support it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I have a Patreon for it, which is I tell people every, it's funny because the podcast is short 
and it's it's once a month so everyone it's it's always leaving wanting more and everyone keeps telling me i want i just want more episodes we want more yeah, of this yeah, like yeah. it's 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 grown a pretty rapid following which is fantastic because i and and i love all the fans of it but i tell everyone it grows in direct proportion to the funds in my patreon account basically like i have the goals there you want another show then give me enough money to make another show every month because you know that's a lot of work yeah yeah so is the when you talk about growing, is it you would just be diverting more of your time to that versus doing commission pieces? Is that kind Ex of AC? Okay. Exactly. It has to take over a certain part of my budget per month to make sense time wise. And gotcha. that way I can I can X out, I can, you know, stop going and hanging doors for people <laughs> and uh do the podcast instead, which is I think what everyone would rather have me doing, except the people who need doors hung. <laughs> yeah. It has a bigger response. Uh were you surprised at the response from it? Uh, I knew that there was a possibility that there would be a good response. I didn't think that people would like it as much because yeah. it's 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 different for what we usually listen to uh, as makers in, in terms of our community space, but it's not very different from a lot of podcasts that are out right. there. Right. But And I thought that way, and I realized after thinking about that, but there's no podcasts that are out there in that kind of, mm -hmm. I keep calling it like the NPR-verse, yeah. but in that, in that space, that handle... Um, making things or uh, uh, what, what I'm talking about. So it's it's kind of this weird bridge of middle ground that like it, it works out really well. Yeah. I mean, there really aren't any like story driven shows. that I can in this, in there, this are, there, there, there are zero from what yeah. I understand. Yeah. Um, if there are any now, it's because they've come out after I started this one. Not because of me, I'm saying. I'm just saying right. that I, you know, I stopped. I, I wasn't looking for similar podcasts after I had the ideas and, and followed through. Are there any stories that you can talk about that you're excited about that you're working on right now? Um, I'm finishing tonight the history of the screw, and yeah. that that episode is entitled uh, "Righty Tidy Lefty Lucy: How the Ancient Greeks Screwed the World." That's awesome. Uh, That's yeah, awesome. and it, it goes it goes through like Archimedes and Archytas and these guys that were like these great ancient minds and thinkers, and it goes up through like the guy who did the Phillips head screws, Phillips and Robertson and. It's it's a long one. It's been yeah. it took me better part of a month and a half to get that one ready. Um, and then from there, yeah, I have uh, hold on, I have a whole list. <laughs> Give me one second. Their podcast. Let's see. Uh, I have one which is the Big Squeeze: A History of Clamps. Uh, uh, and the Router, aka How Woodworking Got Its Groove Back. That's cool. Sometimes I really just rather I think of the titles first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so will you work on like multiple stories at the same time, or are you just yes, kind of one? yeah? Okay. That's something I can't stop my brain from doing. Okay, <laughs> I'm halfway through one story. Like I was last night, I was uh, researching and and writing from the research for the Screw podcast uh, episode, and just I was like, how do I branch off into Allen keys and hex keys? And I was yeah. like, no, no, no. So I just started saving all those links to the history of the allen key which is kind of it's it's sort of interesting it might be more interesting than i thought That's and sweet. so yeah that might be the next one if if i'm like a dog with a scent like if i catch a good one i'm just gonna go after it you know yeah 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 so uh so that episode is that coming out this week uh this episode should be out tonight if everything goes properly for the rest of the day cool so. uh so at the time of this recording so we're, we're talking on uh, tuesday but this is coming out on thursday so that episode mm -hmm. should already be out and it will it will be out by thursday absolutely cool. which is thanksgiving I'll, yeah thanksgiving yeah i'll i gotta, um, I gotta remember that so <laughs> i know where to be on thursday yeah yeah i'll uh, i'll make sure to include a link in the, in the show notes for folks but um well cool well uh i appreciate your time and uh and chatting with me love your work and all the work you're doing into the podcast and uh it's a it's been a fun one to to listen with for a while now so Thanks. This has been great. I love your podcast too. It's well, it's one of the ones I actually listen to when it when, not exactly when it hits because I like to save it. But right, right. You're like, oh, that that guess is boring. I don't listen to that dude. But I'm <laughs> so, well, it's it's usually if I don't know who it is because you actually have a good interview style, so it helps. Yeah, but yeah. If I, I don't know who it is, I'm like, okay, I, I actually have to learn about this person as I listen to them. Yeah, it's not yeah, like, yeah. You know, yeah, and you want to like have people like click on it, so you got to figure out a good title, and you're like, oh yeah, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> that's cool. So on on your making side of things, just keithdecent.com as Keith well as keithdecent.com. Yep. Uh, and YouTube, yeah, there's links, but you just search Keith Decent on YouTube, and and I should be the. I, I'm as far as I know, I'm still the only one. So, did you also did you do a comic? On yeah, I had, yeah, I had. Um, that was another brilliant idea I had, which was to do maker oriented comics, and it was fun for you know three um 
for about three comics and then i had one that wasn't coming together properly and i was just yeah. like you know what it's a medium for me that i really have to put my my full effort into and make absolutely the best possible thing i can make uh, otherwise it's gonna fall flat and be terrible so i kind of fell off that is maybe sometime those, are those out maybe, there um no i kind of i think i took him down okay because <laughs> i was like i was like i thought he did a comic yeah i was trying to find it i'm like maybe this wasn't him but it, i thought it was no it was me and actually i had guest stars in them from other makers and stuff that would be yeah. a fun surprise and at new york maker fair i actually ended up giving those people the original the originals of the comics oh, they were cool in. yeah yeah which was nice um to to see that they liked them and that they weren't too offended at the ridiculous situations i put them in yeah yeah um uh, yeah, I, I did it for a little while. It was fun, but I don't see it being a major part of what I'm doing until maybe down the road if I have some some other free time come up. Got it. Cool. Uh, well, sweet man. Well, I appreciate your your time and chatting with me and all Thanks. the crazy stuff you got you got going on. Sorry, I said and all the crazy stuff you got. Going oh, on. gotcha, gotcha. Sorry, it blipped right <laughs> right in the middle of that sentence. That's no, I probably I, just, I probably just mumbled. Uh, is probably what happened. So. I do that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, sweet man. I, yep. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you.